How do you stay focused for long periods of time? Are there certain evidence-based methods that work better than other methods? What has worked best for me in the past? What changes have I made to my studying and study strategies and focusing strategies during college and now medical school that have helped me to stay focused for longer? So in this video, I'm gonna show you guys how I actually maintain my focus when I'm studying for long, long periods of time in medical school. The first thing I do is I have a start and an end time. Instead of saying, okay, tomorrow I'm gonna study all day, which never works, I actually set certain times for when I'm gonna study and when I'm not going to study. When I'm in this study time, it's just study time. No doing anything else, just studying. But this also means when I'm done with my studying time, when I'm not studying anymore, I don't study anymore. It's not studying time. For example, during the first two years of medical school, we would usually have about four or five hours of activities that were laid out for us during the day that we just had to attend. Now this could be anatomy lab or certain lectures or a certain group meeting. But there was other time, right, during the day that I had time to study. And what worked really well for me is kind of treating the day every day while I'm in medical school like a work day. So what I would do is because this is medical school, my study day, my work day would start at seven instead of nine and end at five. That means from seven to five was my work day or my study time and then after five was over. So I wouldn't study past five o'clock. And this means I would wake up around six o'clock, get my day in order and then start studying between seven and nine. And then maybe I would have my four hours of required activities, have lunch and get back to my house like around 1.32 and then study again for another three hours between two to five. But that also means when I didn't have required activities during the day, I would study pretty much the entire day, right? So I'd study from seven to five, taking like a lunch break and the occasional Pomodoro break, of course, but I would treat it as a work day. My start time was seven and my end time was five. And I usually would stick to this pretty strictly, right? Because as soon as you start to go away from this routine, it becomes easier for other things to creep in, like looking at your phone or watching TV or kind of something like this. And also if it's a work day, right? You have to imagine there's a boss, right? And if there's a boss, you don't want to look bad to your boss. You want to make sure you're actually working during the whole work day. And the other great part about this strategy is it would help me not focus kind of after five o'clock. There's a cool quote from Mark Black and it says, sometimes the most productive thing you can do is relax. And I think it's a little bit cheesy, but I think it's true, right? A lot of times you need that break. So afterwards you can focus even more. If you never take a break and you just try and work all the way through, then you start to lose efficiency with kind of what you're working on. Having a start and end time to my studying let me know that, okay, this is the study time. This is when I study time. And it also let me know that, okay, this is not study time, no more studying. Bottom line, have a start time for studying, have an end time for studying and stick to that. So the next thing to do, the next tip I have is do the worst thing first, or as Mark Twain said, eat the frog. If it is your job to eat a frog, it's best to do it first thing in the morning. And if it's your job to eat two frogs, it's best to eat the biggest one first. Now, I recently discovered this quote and I like it a lot, uh, but I think I've been doing kind of the maxim outlined by this, by this quote for a while. And I don't know if it's because my mom would usually make me do my homework before I was actually allowed to go outside and play, or if it was because I just wanted to get the sucky things over with. I just remember kind of growing up and going through high school, I would always start with the worst thing. I would always eat the biggest, smelliest, most disgusting frog right away. Also, who wants like pages of math homework hanging over their head when they want to go outside and hit their brother with sticks? Not me. So I would always do the thing I least wanted to do first. For example, English class at school, I was awful at and I really didn't like, so I'd always write my essays first. I would always do that first. I would write my essay and then I would do the rest of my homework and then I would be able to go outside and kind of chill out. And another way, if you're thinking, okay, I don't want to do this. I kind of want to save the most annoying thing for later because I just, I just don't want to do it now. Another way to think about it is as the day goes on, kind of your mental fortitude dwindles. Your brain is kind of like a muscle, right? And the more tasks you do, the more mental tasks you do, it makes it harder for the subsequent tasks to be done. And some scientists even believe that as the day goes on, your brain kind of starts to build up these toxic chemicals, or they call it a toxic biomolecular accumulation. And it's only cleared out every night when you go to sleep. And without bringing in the scientific articles, right, you can kind of think about this. Like, when do you think you can get more work done? At 10 a.m. on a Monday, or at maybe 4.30 p.m. on a Friday? It's probably easier to do more work at 10 a.m. on a Monday, right? And that makes sense. You've been working, your brain has been working all week. Doing the hardest tasks last, I think, is a mistake because your mental energy, your mental strength is weakest as you go through the day. 
Do the hardest task first. Do it when you're mentally strongest. So eat the frog, commit the most brain power, commit your best effort to this first most hard and most important thing. Do it, get it over with. And like people in France seem to like doing it too. So there must be something to it. Bottom line, do the task you least want to do first. The next tip I have is to remove all distractions. I cannot, I really, if I have my phone anywhere near me, anywhere in my line of sight when I'm studying, I just can't focus. Even if I'm fixed on my screen and thinking, you know what, there's nothing that can tear me away from these amazing medical school flashcards. Really, I see the phone right here. I see it just right there and it's just distracting. And I know it's there and I can sense it's there. So sometimes I'll pick it up and just get distracted by it. I feel its presence and inevitably I pick it up. So whenever I'm studying now, I remove any possible distractions, not just from my desk, but from my line of sight. I actually like throw my phone to another part of the room. I'll take things off my desk. If there's an annoying cushion on the couch, I'll kind of hide it away. I'll really clear everything out. Why do I do this? Well, not only do distractions, I notice these distractions when I'm working, but distractions harm performance. There was this one cool study that I looked up and it took 13 medical students and surgical residents and it asked them to perform laparoscopic surgery. And laparoscopic surgery is basically just a surgery where they have little cameras that they insert into you. So that way they don't have to do big open procedures, right? They just stick a little camera in, they stick another kind of device in, and they can do the procedure all through this camera without making a very large open incision. There's 13 students and residents that are assigned to do this kind of surgical procedure. Don't worry, they're not doing this test on real humans. They're doing it in kind of a virtual reality trainer. So some of them were distracted and some were not. And the distraction was something pretty mundane. It was something like, okay, do the math problem 11 times 14, right now while you're doing the surgery. Well, what were the results? Well, the results were what you expect. The residents and students that were being distracted took 30 to 40% longer to complete the tasks than the others that were not distracted. And to get a little less sciencey and a little more feely, again, I'm gonna bring up Mary Kondo's book here because I really like it. And her book is The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. And a quote from her book is, the question of what you want to own is actually the question of how you want to live your life. I feel like when my desk is cluttered, my mind is cluttered, and my life is even cluttered. So my desk has very little on it, right? It's got a screen, it's got two speakers, a keyboard, and a mouse. And that's really all I try to keep on it. My phone is never on my desk. Food and drink is never on my desk. Notebooks, unless I'm actively using them, are never on my desk. Unused papers are never on my desk. And my first aid book is never on my test because I have it taped to my body at all times. But seriously, why do you, why do I need my notebook, my phone, some food, a drink at my desk all the time when I'm studying? I really don't need that stuff there. And sometimes I take this to an even bigger extreme. Sometimes I literally just pick up this laptop, go to the park and just study there. One, because there's nothing really around to distract me. I can't, I don't have all my little phones and gadgets around. And also I really can't connect to the internet when I'm in the park on this computer. So what I'll do is I'll just be able to go through my studying, go through my flashcards with no distractions coming in whatsoever. So the next bonus step to kind of removing all the distractions from when you study is actually removing the distractions from whatever thing you're working on. So a lot of us nowadays, right, we use computers to work. So I personally use an app called the self-control app and this really makes it hard for me to get distracted on the internet on my computer. It blocks the internet, even kind of mail servers for a certain amount of time so I can't access them at all. Restarting my computer doesn't do anything. Deleting the application doesn't do any, anything. I can't access the apps or the internet or whatever I block using the app no matter what. Anything that I can do to make it easier for me to focus, to remove distractions and help me focus, I do. So bottom line, remove everything from your workspace that you're not actively using right now to get the work done. Block any websites or applications on your computer or phone or whatever that you're not actively using to get the work done. Now, people who take breaks perform better. I have a couple sources that I'll cite down below that kind of support this. People that take breaks do better. And to cut in briefly, kind of a disclaimer to all the data that I talk about and all kind of the research papers that I reference in this video and all videos, right? I have a bias here, right? I'm trying to confirm kind of my ideas and my thoughts in, in each one of these videos where I talk about these things. And the researchers make mistakes too, right? So what you should do is you should look at the sources that I link below, look at them yourself and see if you agree with them or not. But okay, for taking breaks, the data that I looked at seems to strongly support taking breaks because it improves performance. And this is why certain professions actually have breaks mandated to them. For example, medical residents aren't allowed to work supposedly more than 80 hours a week. But beyond kind of the evidence, I know firsthand that implementing study break, study break, study break strategies improves my performance. Based off kind of my studying metrics, which is how many flashcards I can do in a certain amount of time, 
I actually increased my performance by 50% in the same amount of time by taking breaks. When I wasn't taking breaks doing flashcards, I would do maybe 100 flashcards every 30 minutes. And I would do this over three hours. So in three hours, I would be able to do maybe 600 flashcards. And this was just straight work, no breaks. But when I began implementing breaks, I would work for 25 minutes and then take a five minute break. 25 minutes, five minute break. I actually started to do more in that same three hours than I did when I took no breaks. And I did a lot more. I ended up doing 150 flashcards every 30 minutes instead of 100 flashcards every 30 minutes. And that meant over three hours, I was doing actually 900 flashcards instead of 600 flashcards. So personally, this taking breaks really worked for me. And I think this happened for a couple of reasons. One reason is when I was taking no breaks, I kind of needed to integrate some breaks. So I would just kind of pick up my phone, scroll through Reddit, scroll through Instagram without even thinking about it. So kind of mental fatigue started to build up, right? I would be doing cards, 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 and the end of the tunnel was not in sight. I didn't see anything coming up that would give me a break, give me some kind of respite. And I think the worst thing was I got into the habit of not focusing during these three hours because of what I said before. Because I would lose focus, because I felt like I needed a break, I would start to integrate great breaks and not know when I was supposed to be focused and when I was not supposed to be focused. When I started taking breaks, it eliminated 90% of me not focusing. And I think this was because, okay, I know I have to study during this time, and I know I get to not study pretty soon. As a final point, I was trying to figure out the evidence-based amount of time that you should take for when you want to take a break, for taking a break to maximize your performance, but I really couldn't find it. However, there was one certain break strategy, one sneaky key strategy that was across the board supported by the evidence. Now, this one magical break applied to pretty much everyone in every paper I looked at. That's amazing. How, what is this strategy? What is this break? Can you guess what this strategy is? Well, the strategy is sleep. Now there are hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of articles that support sleep and performance. And I'm just gonna take one quote from a review article that I read from the Journal of Neuroscience and Behavioral Reviews. And they said, excessive sleepiness is a serious safety hazard. An insufficient or disrupted sleep results in numerous accidents and adverse mental and physical health outcomes. So bottom line, take breaks and get the proper amount of sleep. My final tip, and this is kind of my most recent and new tip that I've been applying to myself during medical school, is to keep the lights on. So now, during the day, during my study time, I will keep the lights on in my apartment when it's study time. And what I used to do, what I used to do kind of all the time before, is I would come home to my apartment and I would like the lights to be off. It would make me feel like more calm, more relaxed, and like more sleepy. And that way I could kind of relax into my study. But isn't this feeling of sleepiness, isn't this feeling of kind of lower mental energy bad if we're trying to study a lot and focus for a longer period of time? Well, yeah, it might actually be. Light is a dominant player in the regulation of our circadian rhythm. And what the circadian rhythm is, is just your biological clock. So, so it's what your body tells you, okay, now it's wake time or now it's sleep time. The evidence seems to support that blue light pushes, pushes us more towards this awake state while red light pushes us more towards this sleep state. And I find this pretty cool and really interesting. Um, in college, I studied biomedical engineering and this was actually my final project. I was trying to design goggles that would dim or brighten to kind of adjust your circadian rhythm so you could avoid jet lag. During this project, I learned a decent amount of kind of this circadian rhythm and what regulates it. And actually there's a lot of people that are working on this. NASA is actually trying to work on how to figure out to best adjust this because there aren't as good signals in space to regulate your circadian rhythm. Humans weren't evolved to live floating around in space. So when they go into space for extended periods of time, it kind of messes with their whole body. But what the people at NASA are kind of learning about is that you can use light to kind of manipulate and adjust people's circadian rhythms. And this is really important for someone that's driving a spaceship, right? Because you want their awakeness, you want their performance to be best. And when you're more awake, your cognitive performance is better. When you're sleepier, your performance is worse. If we believe everything above and all the resources I linked above, shouldn't we push for a more awake state so we can stay focused longer and perform better cognitively? Ever notice how like office lights, they're always on. People don't turn off the office lights really at any time. These lights above have a large portion of this wavelength of light that kind of hits our retina and then signals to another part of the brain that says, listen, it's awake time. And when it hits that brain of the part that says, listen, it's awake time, the brain then sends other signals to the rest of the body that lets the rest of the body know, like, listen, it's daytime, it's awake time. And some of the chemicals that it upregulates are chemicals like orexin and norepinephrine, and these are more awake chemicals. And some of the chemicals that it down 
regulates is melatonin. I think we're all aware of melatonin. Now, how do we apply this to our lives? How do we turn on more light around us? Well, I think it's fairly straightforward, right? You just have more light when it's study time. Now, during the summertime, if I'm kind of working with a place with big windows and it's not cloudy out, I don't really need to worry about this because there's lots of sunlight streaming in. However, during the winter time or when it's darker in a room with no windows, overhead lighting is essential. I wanna make sure I feel the most awake as possible and having these lights help that happen. And if you still don't believe me, try this. Go to your bedroom, close all the doors, close all the windows and turn off the lights. Bring in your computer and set the brightness to a minimum and try to study. See what it feels like. Is it tough? Do you feel sleepy? Now what I want you to do is turn the brightness to a max on your computer, turn all the lights, turn all the lamps on, open the windows, open the doors, and if you even have any extra lamps, shine them in your face, shine them in your dire general direction. And compare this feeling you have now with all these lights on to the feeling you had before when everything was really dark. Do you notice a difference? So shine some lamps on your face and get to studying. Bottom line is just keep the lights on when you're studying. But that is it. These are tips that I've kind of found useful and that I've been kind of learning and adapting over the years so I can stay focused for longer when I'm studying for kind of a long time during medical school. I hope this video was helpful. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you on the next one.